Yeah, I'm Mike. Let's just start off. I am a computer geek as it gets. Um, did a lot of coding in my past. Um, now I'm officially the uh, vice president for technology and architecture with Copano. Uh, I'll get back into that later. But basically, this talk is about throwing a little bit more light on the coding and contributing ecosystem and uh, basically helping you also on understanding how things come together, basically. So to first start off, no software project is like the other, right? There are so many software projects in the world, specifically also in the free and open source world. Um, not every project really works like the same. So this is, this is really important to know that there is also a vast difference between those various interest groups that exist in these ecosystems. You, as a person, have slightly different motivations than maybe the community. <laughs> Sorry. Test. Did it work? Passo, or? OK. Um, so, so you as a person have uh, potentially different motivations, uh, different ideas of what you want to achieve, of what uh, you personally want to do with your code, than the community in general has, than the company maybe backing the company, or a customer which uses that product commercially, or even an end customer um, who's really using that because it's a hosted service, for example. Um, but all have one shared common goal, and that is really to get stable, working, solid, trusted software, right? You want to have your software doing the job that it's intended to do, and you want to make sure that, and that's one of the key parts of free and open source software, that the transparency also provides the trust in it, that there are no backdoors in there, um, that it's working. Uh, we all don't like bugs, really, um, and obviously we want to have the service up and running. So the thing is, I'm going to take a few examples here. Um, and many of them, I'm sure you know, the Linux kernel uh, is the largest and biggest open source software project that exists in the world. Um, Iridium browser is a Chromium fork um, focused on privacy. Um, Copano, a communication and collaboration suite which uh, protects your data at your premise, on your premise. And uh, OpenSUSE and SUSE Linux Enterprise Server are basically two distributions with uh, slightly different motivations, one more the community side and one more the business side. So to look at these different organizational structures, you will see that the Linux kernel is just really demand-oriented with the typical chain of trust in development, otherwise it wouldn't scale. And even with that, it has certain issues with scaling. Um, but generally in the Linux kernel, the saying is, it's done when it's done, and it's done when it's good. So what is good? Basically everything I told before. It must be stable, it must be secure. To the knowledge of the people involved at the time. <clears throat> it's also one of the reasons why uh, someone like Linus uh, really gets angry at people if it breaks uh, any API, because he says, no, there is no need to break API. Um, yeah, then we have Iridium Browser. Uh, it's a project-oriented thing. Basically, the, the, this, this is a specific project with the idea. We want to take the good technology of Chromium, but we want to enable it with privacy, because since we all know Google has the interest in your data, it might be that you don't have the interest in sharing your data. Um, OpenSUSE is really an open community where they say, hey, we want to get the best software together and just provide it to about anybody who wants it. And uh, so this is basically, yeah, OpenSUSE with a real customer and market demand, people that demand support, professional services, things that a company traditionally needs. You know, it's, it's hard to ask someone in the community at 3 o'clock in the morning, hey, I have a problem here, can you help me out? So that's where you have companies behind there where people get salaries paid to, to do their job, essentially. And Copano is also, um, it's a community and a commercially backed uh, project. Where actually there are many projects within Copano, but this is, this is an example of a hybrid. So, as I outlined at the beginning, contributors always 
have the thing like, hey, I provided you the patch. Why isn't this showing up now? I mean, it's there, it works. Everything is cool, just go for it. Well, the thing is, is it's good that things take some time because what I'm about to show you is, is a little bit the implications that even a one-liner can have. We were referring, or I was referring to major software products. So major must be defined, right? And when you hit Google uh, by the definition and saying, hey, what is major? And it says fully developed, full grown. So to bring that a little bit uh, onto software, um, my personal definition of major software is it's, it's widely deployed, really production installations in at least tens of thousands. It runs on a variety of platforms, Little Endian, Big Endian, if it's Power, if it's uh, 64, x86, 64, or whatever platform. And also downstreamed, like we are, like Copano also is. It's uh, included in Debian, for example, in Ubuntu, in OpenSUSE, so in various platforms, basically. So when you, as a committer, want to commit code, um, you should also, and this is a strong echo back in an in open source community, we do regularly get contributions, but they do not watch, actually. They, they, it's amazing how many people really send you contributions, and there's actually like the third or fourth iteration of the problem. Um, and sometimes even you have identical patch sets for it. But they do create side issues, which I will get back into it. So if you as a committer want to commit to any software project in the world, and don't get an angry Linus, or uh, don't have people starting to ignore you, you should a little bit do your homework and just check in GitHub, is this issue maybe already known? In the Iridium browser, for example, we had so many bugs, people complaining about H.264, for example. Well, it's a pat patented codec, which is not integrated. And there are like five or six issues uh, where we simply say, guys, Yes, and this is not going to happen because we're simply not going, we, we, this, is a, this is an open source project and there's no funding for a six digit uh, licensing of the H.264 uh, codec, so that's why it's not going to happen. Next to that is license. Um, when you commit code, you must agree to the terms. Um, the, there was a talk this morning which was quite nice from, um, I don't know his name anymore, but he was from IBM, uh, which really brought up what types of differences in specific licenses you have. So um, there are sometimes uh, code commit um, uh, rules that you have to obey. There are sometimes licenses that you have to obey, sometimes contributor agreements. Um, if you don't want to agree to it, well, then let it be. Or in a different thing, a developer that you're complaining about, ah, can I have this in a different license? It's probably not the right guy to ask. It's probably someone else, like a project lead in GitHub or whatever. Um, one of the next things is, when you create a pull request or service request in OBS or whatever, be descriptive. One-liners are nice, and it's like sometimes people have, have the uh, intention of, yeah, it says everything, but the reality is be more descriptive, and it ha really helps on the other side uh, of the aisle to understand what's going on. Um, adapt and follow the individual project coding style. This is really a very important one. Um, it's like when, we, when you personally would write something like, writing an essay or so. Everyone has its own style, right? And that's also in coding. So based on your coding capabilities, you develop your own style. And um, it's unfortunate if, if you get rejected as a committer because you're not following basic guidelines. That's why you always have these project guidelines. And there are many different ones. Linux kernel is completely different to Python or to Go or to whatever. So really, if you want to commit in that sp specific era, uh, specific space, keep to it. And also, what is the best way to get in touch? So an example of a project structure is obviously the Linux kernel. Um, Linux kernel is, as I already uh, mentioned, it's completely based on the trust principle. And um, so this is actually also a little bit of system which most people think that it's built up like a democracy, but it's absolutely not. 
It's more like a monarchy where the king has been voted for basically and he's trusted lifelong until he passes away or whatever. Let's hope not, not too soon. But the thing is, um, it's merit-based. It's a merit-based system. So uh, obviously, Linus deserves most credit for actually inventing this project. And other people like Andrew Morton or Greg Cora Hartman, they did a great job in managing the next kernel um, in managing branches stable-wise. Uh, I mean, Greg Crow Hartman was maintaining the, the, the uh, stable tree for ages. So um, this is a system, for example, which is actually quite unique. You won't find that too often based on, on this. Switching over to what we actually do, again, complete... Um, it's a complete collaboration stack. It's very modular. So we have a lot of separate repositories in various languages, ranging from C++, Python, and so on. Um, you should know that every commit that you create is joined in a life cycle. So when you create a commit, and that's not exclusive to us, that is in the most major software products, especially when there's a company behind there, um, that's the case. So you have a commit. From the commit on, you get into a review. From a review point on, you have your continuous integration QA going on, basically automated testing. And from automated testing, this goes to real QA. And from real QA, it can get into a release. So let's look how it looks like. So for in, in the review part, um, it's, again, in a major software product, it's merit-based. So you trust certain people based on their experience in that product. Um, so good software systems, um, GitHub being one of them. Uh, we personally use the Atlassian stuff, but everything is just a tool. Everything is based on how you implement things and how you implement the rules. And for us, um, if you create a pull request, you need at least three succeeding reviews. Otherwise, the code is not going further down the chain. Why is that? I mean, even I'm one of the, at least in a core project, one of the reviewers of the code. And uh, sometimes, even for us, things slip through, right? We didn't think to the end. Um, but the review process already gives a lot of potential in terms of eliminating obvious things of thinking of, hey, have you been thinking of this? You're breaking a complete different feature here. So think about that. So this whole review is a very important part. If you don't do reviews, you don't do good code. That's the reality. You can be the best coder in the world, but you always forget something. So it helps into quality, uh, code quality. It helps you identify potential side effects. It keeps also, which is also nice for a software project, it keeps the conversation going, right? Is you're, peop you're talking to people, and you're not talking to computers. So it's, it's really good because you also can only learn from that and therefore base your future um, experience also on the input that you get from other sites. Style guidelines, obviously, so especially in the beginning when you're committing to a project, you get into the situation where, um, ah, I'm not certain, maybe I didn't understand certain aspects of the, of the coding guidelines because they can be very long. Just look at the asterisk guideline, it's really humongous. Um, and yeah, once in a while we all fuck up and so um, it helps to do a review. Next part is continuous integration. So, um, I will give you some numbers in the end, but every commit, at least I can speak for Copano and for some other software projects as well, every commit that you create just starts off continuous integration checks. So automated, tested, automated tests are running with hopefully a good code coverage. Um, also merge tests, because specifically when we're talking about a large code base, you have the issue that things need to fit in together, basically also for a release. Uh, generally, sanity checks, uh, linting and packaging, for example, and also very important memory leak checks. So just out of experience, like three years ago, we had a heck of a lot of memory leaks because we simply didn't check them intensively enough. So for example, we had a high speed allocation algorithm used from SGI. Turns out that was leaking like, I leave that word out. So from, from Code to quality code also means that 
um, you check for all kinds of regressions, instabilities, for example, and if you have any, which is also a type of a regression, degradation of a scalability or a performance or interoperability. So you want to make sure, for example, customers trust our solution because they want to keep their data safe, right? And they want to have their data fast. So the user experience is very important, but most of all, they want to make sure that their data is as safe as it gets. And uh, when you introduce new features, when you introduce uh, bug fixes whatsoever, um, things can change. So it's, it's very important that you always take in mind to have good code coverage. And here we are actually, this is, this is from Coverity. I don't know if you, if you know that solution, but it helps you identify um, weak spots in your code, basically. It's a great product. Can only recommend it. So here you can see that we're actually far under the average defect density of open source software, but we've not always been that way. Um, and the last check, and this is something also that, that no, I mean, I'm not talking about artificial intelligence or anything like that here now, because obviously that would be a vector that, that can approach things like that. But real QAers, real testers are still important because they know the software. They know where to look at. They know when certain things are in, and they also often know customers, right? Because they, they are also in a group where they get feedback from, from other people and say like, ah, why didn't we catch it last time? Um, so it's, it's really good that um, you have QA personnel in place, testers in place, which can you know, do the extra work. Even if you have a good code coverage, you still need testers that can professionally um, yeah, address, um, yeah, address things that, that come along, especially with very large commits that come around. And obviously also documentation needs to be updated as well. Um, going from QA to release means what is about backwards incompatibilities, API, ABI. Obviously, we never want to change API, ABI as much, but when you introduce new features, it can be that you have to introduce new calls. New calls change, uh, can require changes in existing calls, and therefore can break API or ABI stability. At least, maybe not on the short term, but on the long term. And therefore, um, this is something very important that needs communication, um, that needs testing, um, and especially when it comes to behavioral changes, this is something that needs really to be communicated out to the world. This is an example of the Zpush project, of the checklist that we do with every even minor release. Yeah, so I promised you some numbers. So for Copano, it's um, one commit that you create for six platforms that is like CPU architecture, like 64-bit or 32-bit or ARM64, uh, ARCH64, RMV7, PPCLE, and uh, S390X. Then you have eight test groups behind there. We're talking about all kinds of unit tests. Um, and then we have 35 distribution targets in total. So that's all the kind of distributions you can imagine from Debian, Ubuntu, SUSE, Red Hat, you name it. And so one commit actually generates 1,680 tasks per commit. Pulling the numbers of just what one well, this is not true. Two repositories of us, this is Copano Core and Copano Dependency, created in just 2018 means that in a QA, we did 2,800,000 uh, 2, tasks to be done to make sure that our software has a high standard and quality. Yeah, so this is basically it. I think I ran out of time anyway, so <laughs> if you have questions, just let me know. We have time for at least one question, a quick one, if there's any. All questions asked. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can get back to Mike. Uh, I think he's at the uh, Copano booth sometime as well. Thank you. If there's one. Thank you very much.